there's so much happening at the moment in the space sector that it's quite easy to miss important key developments. In particular, in the two months since my last update, there has been a tremendous amount of progress made by SpaceX, much of which will directly feed into the company's long-term Mars ambitions. So today I'm going to focus primarily on the recent accomplishments and news from SpaceX, along with what they have planned for later in the year, as well as offering you a brief update on NASA's direction under their new administration. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket has launched four times since my last update, each of which has featured impressive new milestones. First up was the Commercial Resupply Services, or CRS, 11 mission to the International Space Station on June 3rd. Notably, the Dragon spacecraft used for this mission was actually the same one used for the CRS-4 mission in 2014, marking the first time that a Dragon spacecraft had been reused. Far from a one-off though, reusable Dragons will rapidly become the norm, as the next SpaceX resupply mission, CRS-12, currently scheduled to launch early next week, will actually be the last time that a new first-generation Dragon capsule will be used. SpaceX followed up with two further flights in June. The Bulgaria Sat-1 mission, which was the second time a first-stage booster had been reused, and the Iridium-2 mission, which saw the first usage of newly upgraded titanium grid fins with a vastly improved tolerance for re-entry heat as a further step towards rapid reusability. What was particularly notable about these launches is that they took place within two days of each other, one from Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A on the US East Coast, and one from Vandenberg Air Force Base Launch Complex 4 on the US West Coast. Given that SpaceX's previous launch turnaround record was 13 days, this represented a notable milestone. Finally, the Intelsat 35E launch on July 5th set another record by being the heaviest payload at over 6.7 metric tons launched by a Falcon 9 to geostationary transfer orbit. Interestingly, this satellite was actually originally scheduled to launch on the Falcon Heavy, but continual upgrades to the Falcon 9 over the years meant that it could be launched with just a single booster. After these four launches, which took place in just over a month, there has been a quiet period where all launches have stood down for a routine range downtime. But the pause is about to end, with launches resuming next week. If one thing is becoming clear, it's that this year is finally seeing the rapid launch frequency SpaceX has promised for a number of years. With 10 launches so far, and another 12 still planned for later in the year, 2017 seems set to completely eclipse last year's record of just 8 launches. And even this present rate will increase over time, as by the end of the year SpaceX will have 3 operational launch pads, with a fourth going online in 2018. Indeed, at the current rate, internal projections show a notional target of 52 launches in 2019 alone. So clearly SpaceX have demonstrated that they can rapidly launch missions. But the next step will be to see how rapidly they can prepare previously recovered boosters for reflight. Their current refurbishment record now stands at 5 months as the booster used for the Bulgaria Sat-1 mission previously flew back in January. Ultimately, they have an extremely ambitious target of a 24-hour turnaround period without refurbishment by the end of 2018. There are also ongoing attempts to recover payload fairings by the end of this year for reuse in missions in 2018, which would save an additional $5 to $6 million per mission. 2017 is definitely shaping up to be one to remember, but the achievements of the second half of this year may completely dwarf those in the first half. In particular, Elon Musk has confirmed that the maiden flight of the Falcon Heavy is now scheduled for November, just three months away. And whilst this is a small slip from the October estimate I gave last time, 
It does seem that we are finally converging on this long-awaited and anticipated launch. With two side boosters returning on landing pads and the centre core landing on a drone ship, the first flight of the world's most powerful operational rocket will be a sight to remember. And the stakes are pretty high as SpaceX cannot afford to lose pad 39A in a launch failure, as this is precisely where SpaceX will be launching astronauts from as part of NASA's commercial crew program next year. Speaking of which, NASA has recently announced new target dates for SpaceX's first missions in their crewed program. Demo Mission 1 will see an uncrewed Dragon 2 visit the International Space Station in February 2018, with Demo Mission 2 seeing SpaceX's first astronaut launch in June 2018. Establishing reliability for crewed launches during this program is absolutely necessary before their lunar tourism missions, which now looks set to begin in the 2019 timeframe. Nevertheless, they've been making steady progress towards these dates, including recently practicing recovery and crew rescue from a Dragon 2 model. There have been some modifications to the Dragon 2 capsule recently though, with one of the most important being the removal of its landing legs. You might recall that the Dragon 2 was originally designed to land propulsively, but due to difficulties in satisfying safety qualification requirements for the thermal protection on the landing legs, Elon Musk recently confirmed at the International Space Station Research and Development Conference that propulsive landings are now off the table. Instead, Dragon 2 will simply use parachutes and splash down in the ocean. This design change has extreme ramifications for SpaceX's Mars missions, as propulsive landing was a vital part of the Red Dragon entry, descent and landing sequence I discussed last year. The result is that the Red Dragon missions have unfortunately been cancelled. But not to worry though, as they are refocusing resources towards developing new entry, descent and landing techniques for their more ambitious interplanetary transport system. It also appears that a new compromise is emerging, where the ITS will be downsized from an original 12 meters down to 9 meters, in order to fulfill the role that was once envisioned for Red Dragon. Much work has taken place on preparing for the ITS since it was announced by Elon last September, including dozens of Raptor engine prototype tests. Progress on their Mars vehicle also looks set to accelerate from next year, as both SpaceX's president, Gwen Shotwell, and one of their vice presidents, Tim Hughes, has recently confirmed that a large fraction of SpaceX's launch vehicle engineering team will be switching over to the ITS once the final version of the Falcon 9, the Block 5, is complete at the end of this year. Ultimately, we'll find out much more about SpaceX's refined Mars architecture at the end of September, when Elon delivers a presentation to the International Astronautical Congress in Australia, including how they intend to fund its development. Financing a single Mars mission, let alone a permanent settlement, was always going to be a challenging prospect. But there are some very encouraging signs that SpaceX are on the right track. For example, this remarkable chart shows how rapidly SpaceX's share of commercial launch contracts has grown over time, from less than 10% in 2013 to over 40% this year, and potentially 60% next year. They also recently secured $350 million in a funding round, which resulted in a company valuation of $21 billion double what they were worth in just 2015, and making them one of the most valuable privately held companies in the world. At the heart of SpaceX's success is their efficiency at developing technology at a fraction of the cost of traditional contracts. For example, in 2011, NASA estimated that it would have cost them $4 billion to develop a Falcon 9-like rocket using a traditional contract while SpaceX developed both the Falcon 1 and the first version of the Falcon 9 for just $390 million, a factor of 10 times cheaper. Even if you account for the subsequent upgrades to the Falcon 9 to enable reusability, estimated at around $1 billion, 
you see that SpaceX developed a reusable rocket for a quarter the cost of what NASA would have paid to contract for an expendable vehicle. For comparison, NASA's expendable Space Launch System rocket costs $2 billion per year to develop, and potentially $3 billion for each launch once it's operational. It seems obvious that the raw efficiency of the commercial space sector will win out in the long term, and that this will be to the benefit of everyone. So where does NASA fit into all of this? Are they supportive of companies with their own plans for deep space missions? Well, yes and no. I discussed NASA's own Mars mission architecture, including their deep space gateway in orbit around the moon, in my last update, so I won't repeat that here. But it does seem to have the scope for involving the commercial sector. I will add something extra though that I didn't mention last time, in that NASA's 2018 budget calls for the cancellation of their asteroid redirect mission, but they will be continuing the technology developments of certain aspects of this, notably including solar electric propulsion. For the moment at least, there are somewhat mixed messages coming through as to how NASA will approach potential collaborations with commercial space. On the one hand, the US Vice President Mike Pence, who chairs the newly reinstated National Space Council, has been very vocal in support of commercial space. But on the other hand, the new Executive Secretary of the Council, Scott Pace, is a long-standing critic of SpaceX, who prefers traditional government contracts with extensive NASA oversight. Hopefully the situation will become clearer in the near future. One person who has not been afraid to speak his mind, though, is ex-NASA astronaut Buzz Aldrin, who has recently suggested defunding the International Space Station in 2020 to free up funding for an ambitious Lunar and Mars program. Instead of the Deep Space Gateway approach, he recommends taking the international partnership that is already present on the International Space Station, adding China, and working together to construct lunar bases, mining ice to produce fuel, and then push onwards to Mars. SpaceX, meanwhile, in a testimony to the US Senate's Space Science and Technology Committee, seems to favour NASA applying a similar mentality behind the highly successful International Space Station resupply contract, but to deep space missions. This would involve NASA setting overall goals, milestones and costs, whilst letting competing private companies decide on how precisely they achieve the goals, crucially without extensive oversight from NASA, which they argue risks stifling innovation. What do you think? Should NASA lead an international collaboration to Mars? Or should they transition to an advisory role, providing monetary incentives for private companies to explore, develop and settle space? Please drop your thoughts in the comments below and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Last time, I posted a video of a TV debate I recently took part in on the ethics of colonising Mars. As always, many of you weighed in with your own insights with an example being Relays and Things note that colonising Mars is not mutually exclusive with fixing the problems here on the Earth. Rick also asked about SpaceX's new Mars landing technique following the Red Dragon cancellation. I'll be sure to discuss this in a future video as a logical follow-on from my video last year on Red Dragon's EDL sequence. In the meantime, please let me know your thoughts, questions and comments on this video down below, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest developments in our journey to settle the Red Planet.